uh, quite a bit of work looking at different uh, new, uh, new emerging uh, concepts in building design. Uh, we were privileged to be involved in some of the early planning for this uh, 60L building in, uh, in Carlton in, uh, in Melbourne, which is the um, uh, Australian Conservation Foundation headquarters, which has got a, a, a quite uh, innovative both energy and water and other things, but certainly in terms of energy and water. And uh, as I've said, the importance of looking at the energy that's in water, which is partly about the transport, the conveyance, and uh, the embodied energy uh, in water, which has come from a long distance away or up a very steep hill, uh, it can be very high. We've uh, done some work in Alice Springs, and uh, as many of you will know, that's fossil water they're using there. There's a lot of it, but it's still fossil water. And uh, the water, uh, groundwater is dropping at about a metre and a half every year. Uh, as a result of the extractions. And so every time it drops, and uh, you then have to build, spend another hundred or $300,000 on new pumps. And so there's a but by the time it gets into town, uh, it's using about, uh, well, it's the 1,200 years, so it's about 1 1.2 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions for every megalitre of water that gets into town. So it's, it's getting up there. I mean, desal is about four or five tonnes, so it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's a reasonably sizable fraction of, of desalinated water and certainly higher than a lot of recycled water uh, just, to, just to pump it. So uh, the other issue is the, the embodied energy in hot water. Hot water, uh, if we can think of desal being uh, four or five uh, tonnes per megalitre in the, in the water itself from just the treatment, uh, from the creation of the water, if you have hot water, then it's probably got something like uh, 20 to 30 tonnes per megalitre of greenhouse gas emissions embodied in it. So if you can save hot water, then you can save an enormous amount of greenhouse emissions. So, and the other side is the water and energy, which I, I showed you earlier, at least a, a bit of a, a one possible league table. And so the question then is, how do we mine that synergy? How do we make the most of that in our buildings? And part of it is to look at how buildings are cooled and indeed water is an incredibly useful commodity because it's got one of the highest uh, uh, latent heat of vaporisation. So it's actually very useful as a, as for cooling towers. Uh, so you don't want to give that up lightly. Uh, but of course that means you've got increased use of uh, water for cooling. So there are some solutions emerging in terms of uh, in-ground heat pumps. So you uh, drill into the ground and use the, the earth as, as the, uh, the way of uh, cooling buildings. Uh, improving thermal performance of buildings, which reduces dramatically the cooling tower water use, even though it's an energy efficiency measure. Appropriate use of shading, uh, pumping. Uh, one of the traps we have is we, if we design in rainwater tanks into buildings and then we lose, the, we break the pressure from the mains, you then have to pump all that water again. So, in fact, in the first design of the ACF building, uh, the energy cost of the pumping was actually going to outweigh all of the energy savings that they'd made with the energy efficiency. So that was quickly changed to try and use the, the pressure of the incoming water as a, as a means of uh, maintaining that. And of course water is an incredibly good heat storage device. So if you build in uh, water storage, effluent storage into buildings in such a way that you can use that mass, uh, then it's, it, it can actually be an incredible improvement to thermal efficiency. And we've, we've seen very little of that thinking yet, but it's starting to this is just a very, again, the detail uh, you can look at later, but the, uh, it's just a, uh, a bit of a league table based on our work in southeast Queensland uh, with the Traveston Crossing Dam, looking at different solutions. Uh, desal plants on the left, as you can see, over in this case over five tonnes per megalitre of greenhouse gas emissions. The IPR stands for Indirect Potable Reuse, which is emerging of considerable interest. You've probably heard about the controversy in Toowoomba and so on, and it's, uh, it's likely we're almost certain to have indirect potable reuse fairly soon in some Australian city or other. Uh, and as you can see, it's non, not trivial in energy terms, probably about one and a half to two tonnes. Uh, and looking across to Traveston Crossing Dam, which uh, uh, it, you, the energy use in that is pumping the water 200 kilometres from the north of that region down to Brisbane where most of the demand is. So you can see that uh, you can get quite sizable energy intensities uh, just, just because of the pumping cost, as I mentioned earlier. And, of course, the negative ones here are the water efficiency programs that save hot water uh, can actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions by uh, upwards of uh, 20 or 30 tonnes per megalitre because you're saving such a high embodied energy source of water. So we actually did the calculation of the difference between the, 
demand management of water efficiency strategy and the dam uh, with all of its pumping and showed that it was about, I think about uh, 900,000 tonnes the difference per year of greenhouse gas emissions uh, of what would be saved compared to what would be generated, emitted, uh, which is, as, it, uh, as we say here, equivalent to removing 15% of the cars off the road in southeast Queensland, just the difference in the two strategies uh, in greenhouse terms. So this is not looking at the other impacts. So just to wrap up, what, what would need to happen next? Well, the first thing is that these things will not happen by themselves. I mean, the current market, the current systems of investment, the current patterns of uh, ownership are such that these things are often prevented from happening directly by the policies that we have in place. Uh, so we need a appropriate policy instruments which will ensure that investment flows to the most cost-effective options. Uh, and that, uh, I mean, this is true both in the energy and water sector. Uh, we will not get the optimal investment level in efficiency if we so-called leave it to the market. Uh, that's, that's demonstrably true and uh, it's been clear over history that the market will not ensure that they have optimum investment, which means we actually need to have an integrated resource planning framework applied to decision making so that we can actually say, well, which is the lowest cost means? Is it actually uh, spending $50 million on investing in improving the efficiency of appliances, improving the efficiency of energy use or water use in the community, knocking on people's doors saying, how can we help you to, to use less of our product, that sort of thing, versus uh, you know, spending potentially upwards of $500 million equivalent on, uh, on a new supply, which would provide the same, same benefit. These are the sorts of differences in magnitude that we're talking about. We're talking about often ratios of uh, four or five to one in terms of the relative cost of doing the same thing providing the same service. So we need to apply that kind of framework. We need to have robust community engagement because the community actually is, has very strong common sense about this. Uh, and, and that's even without having necessarily a very informed debate in the community. But in the examples that I've seen where you have uh, citizen juries or consensus conferences where you have people who are randomly selected so that you don't get the usual loud voices, uh, from either side, that <laughs> you get randomly selected citizens in a room and you have them spoken at and talked to and informed by the experts, including activists and industry people and uh, people who've got a, a chip on their shoulder and so on. If you have uh, that group with enough time, and usually these uh, sessions should run for no less than two days uh, and preferably for three or more, then, uh, and you have some ability of that group to influence a decision, so it's not just a token effort, these three requirements of a good, robust community engagement, then you see remarkable things happen. I've seen it with my own eyes in terms of people's uh, perception and attitude and understanding, including their understanding of an opposing view. To say they put off, they take their hat of consumer or self-interested individual off and they put on a hat which is citizen and it happens usually about halfway through the first day or three quarters of the way through the first day, it's quite remarkable. So we need more of those processes about these big decisions rather than leaving it to the experts like me or Tony or <laughs> other people who, are, who have expertise but actually don't, uh, are not the ones who should be making the decision, at least not by themselves. Um, we need to think about the linkages, the integration and the coordinated planning across water and energy. We actually can no longer think about these things in isolation uh, because there are so many linkages perhaps most strongly between water and energy, but also, I would say, transport and waste and, and so on. Um, and we can learn, these infrastructure areas can learn from each other. And I would particularly say that, and not just because uh, it's, it's a neat idea, but actually because it's likely to be cheaper, uh, it's likely to be quicker, uh, and it's likely to be the way of the future. We need to think pretty carefully about the idea of uh, maximising the distributed infrastructure